I am Mike Costello. I am a chef at Lost Creek Farm in uh, North Central West Virginia. And we got to meet Tara last year when we were doing a program with some other food businesses here in West Virginia. And we got connected and she's been really helpful to push us to do some more things here on our farm, which is a historic family farm that has been in my partner Amy's family for quite some time. Uh, we're in a farmhouse that we're sort of in a never ending state of under constructedness. Yeah. And uh, it was built in the late 1880s or so. And the farm has been a working farm for quite some time. It was also abandoned for some time and we are trying really hard to bring it back both to be a working farm, as well as a destination for the enjoyment and the learning and the kind of celebration of a place-based West Virginian or Appalachian cuisine. So a little bit about just what we do here on the farm. We, uh, we are a working farm and a culinary business and a teaching business. So we, we raise meat rabbits here on the farm. We are a commercial bakery at times and a very small scale. Amy is one of the few commercial bakers left in the region who makes this traditional salt rising bread. That is a bacteria leaven bread, a traditional recipe of this region. And we, for the longest time, had kind of been thinking about getting back into food. Both Amy and I worked in conservation fields for a long time. But when we got together, Amy was an environmental lawyer and I was working on environmental conservation stuff. But I worked in food a long time ago and had always kind of wanted to get back to it. And it was a matter of figuring out what that really looked like. We both were from families. We both grew up on farms. So we, we had a lot of food heritage in our blood, both of us. And we were very both proud of and connected to this place. And we were very interested in how food connected to culture. And as we got more serious about starting a place-based business, we wanted to um, really kind of emphasize that, that sort of culture-based cuisine, but we weren't really getting a lot of help necessarily locally because there were these tendencies to kind of distance ourselves here in West Virginia from our own cuisine because of this complicated history of stereotype and damaging narratives around poverty, which uh, eventually though, Amy and I sort of had some experiences that really sort of opened our eyes and sort of saw a lot of opportunity in doing something that very few other places in West Virginia were doing, kind of embracing this sort of place-based identity around food and of culture and really uh, taking it on in every, every aspect. And in order to do so, it was necessary for us to not just cook food that was very much of the region or of the community here, but tie those specific foods to stories because it was those stories that really connected the food to people and connected those people to place and to a broader sort of sense of culture that people could feel like they were a part of through our business and what we could really feel like we were sort of representing. So let's talk a little bit about kind of how we operate as a business that is a food business, but also sometimes in more respects, a, a storytelling business. So one of the ways we do this is through the collection of oral histories, through the documentation of knowledge, food knowledge, farm knowledge, traditional methods that have been in Appalachia for a very, very long time, or traditions that are are very old, but maybe are from recent immigrants to Appalachia. The guy here on the right is a prolific seed saver who uh, we featured in some of our seed saving work and he's from Turkey and he moved here two years ago and he has now the largest seed saving operation in all of West Virginia, uh, where he grows, I think this year he grew 450 varieties of mostly Turkish beans and peppers and all kinds of stuff. In addition to a lot of Appalachian varieties. But we, we spend a lot of time with people who are tradition bearers and who are carrying on old recipes and saving old seeds and these little bits and pieces that can make up this broader food culture. Because a lot of this, just like the salt rising bread that Amy bakes, is endangered because there are a lot of sort of old timers that are still around keeping these things going, but very few people are willing to walk in their footsteps and keep these things alive. So there are many, many cases where maybe tradition bears don't have kids who are carrying on the particular sausage making tradition or bread making tradition or seed saving tradition. And, and that's kind of where we have to spend a lot of time stepping in and documenting some of these things. Now we've in the last year or so we've turned that into another 
opportunity. We do a lot of media work with our stories. Some of that is writing for local and national publications. Some of that is in a few different book proposals that we're working on with some national publishers, but we have also created a storytelling podcast called the Pickle Shelf Radio Hour that is based on a lot of the material that we've recorded over the last few years about uh, food traditions and the people who are behind them. So a very different format than this kind of interview chat cast style. This is some more of a narrative storytelling kind of podcast. And we have seen a lot of good response and traction to that. And that, that is evolving into one of our primary offerings here at the farm. We also do a whole lot of teaching. We operate in what I sometimes like to call the, the knowledge economy here in West Virginia, which is that, um, you know, a lot of these traditions are passed down and they're passed down, not so much money in mind, but very much with the economy in mind. And in some ways your knowledge is like a currency. So you exchange knowledge and the only expectation is that you're going to go somewhere and to somebody else and pass that knowledge on so that the tradition stays alive. Now, of course, this has turned into our livelihood. So a lot of what we, what we do is we put on these workshops from sometimes they're 30 minutes. Sometimes they're a whole week of workshops where we're breaking down a whole hog and we're using all of the pieces of the hog to um, make sausage and smoke hog jowls and make lard and then make desserts from the lard. And we're spending every moment of that whole week sort of in this very immersive hands-on experience learning about the actual techniques, but also a lot of the people and the stories behind some of these traditions. And this is really our passion project, I think, is teaching because for us, there's there's only really so much that we can do as a business, as a culinary business, to feel like we are furthering traditions and carrying on traditions and carrying on a culture and expanding that culture. But it's through the teaching, whether that's virtually or in person, that we really feel like we make the most traction into getting people to to kind of recapture and relearn and take back a lot of their food ways that have either been lost or are, again, in danger of of being lost for a very long time. But most of what we are known for here is putting on these pop-up dinners. And we put on these dinners from anywhere from uh, 20 guests to 200 guests or so. And in a variety of venues here, I think in this slide is kind of a pretty good representation. It's a big image there that's at a, it's actually at a private residence. And then the top right, that's actually at a, at a cidery where we team up with them to do a cider pairing dinner a couple times a year during non COVID times. And then the uh, bottom right is at a, uh, a local bison farm. So we get to kind of travel around and, and sort of perform in a way at a variety of venues. We usually do a six or seven course small plate dinner where we get to mix it up with a lot of diversity and we, we get to pack a lot of stories into those meals. So with every course we put out, uh, there is some, usually actually a few stories. Sometimes there's stories about the farmers who grew the produce or gave us these delicious meats that we're working with or these proteins or they might be stories about the traditional recipes that we're working with or the immigrant communities who handed down these specific traditions for so long. But this is sort of what kind of put us on the map, I guess, because there weren't really other people that were doing this kind of model of pop-up dinner. One of the, the things I always have to do because it's kind of hard to explain our business model in a way when people are only thinking of uh, you know restaurants or catering companies which kind of on paper, I guess we operate uh, sort of like a catering company, but in reality, we're, you know, we're very much not that, but I, I say we're sort of the culinary equivalent of a traveling band where every night we, we go out and provide a meal is a little bit like a concert. You know, you've got a venue that sort of sets everything up. They sell all of the tickets. They do all of the promo. We step in during showtime and we perform for a night and then we pack everything up and we go to another venue and we do it all over again. You know, what we hear from people all the time is that it, it feels like a concert too. It's like the food was great, but what we really came for was the experience and sort of the show of all of it, uh, which is a very, very different experience than you're able to get 
in a restaurant setting, not just that sort of intimate react interaction with us, but also just the setting and the flow and the big communal tables that I, I miss so much during the times of COVID. That sort of diversity is so important because a lot of what we serve is stuff that people haven't really heard of before. And it's something that they would probably be very hesitant to order on the menu at a restaurant if they had the choice. On the left here is that salt rising bread that Amy bakes. We have the trout mousse kind of thing with these trout chicharrones almost. It, it, it's like these deep fried trout skins. Another thing is like people tell us all the time about these things. They're like, I would never have thought to order that on the menu. It just didn't really mm -hmm. sound maybe that good, but then it was amazing. So I would definitely do it again. On the right, it's this old fashioned vinegar pie. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one that we definitely have to serve in this context because when given the choice, it's really hard for people to say that, uh, you know, vinegar pie sounds delicious enough to order that for dessert, but it is a mock lemon pie that tastes exactly like lemons and it just blows people's minds every time. And it's so fun. I mean, it's so fun to tell the story of something like vinegar pie because it is a, you know, a story about this kind of rural innovation at a time of necessity to be able to tap your pantry and these very basic ingredients like apple cider vinegar and nutmeg to come together and create uh, almost precisely these flavors of lemons. And people are always you know, blown away by, by that experience, not just of tasting the food and being surprised, but also of hearing the story and connecting with food in a very different way. Sourcing wise for these kinds of meals, Sometimes it, it really depends on the season. So, we, you know, we do have a lot of farming going on here on our own farm. There are times where we'll put out a meal where almost everything comes from our farm, except for maybe a few staples or a few vegetables that we would get that are not the heirloom varieties that we really hone in on here in the farm. So in our garden, we're growing a lot of heirloom beans and corn and tomatoes and squash really like a lot of heirlooms that people have passed seed on to us and they're really rooted in place-based stories. But if we're buying onions or lettuce or something, we're working with other farms. So sometimes we do a meal and over those six or seven courses, we might have 35 or 40 different farms represented in that one entire meal. So when we met Tara last year, we had only been a road show. We had never done anything on our farm because our farm was always under construction. It still very much is, and I think it will always be to some extent so under construction. And we said, you know, we're, we're not quite ready for people to come here yet. And Tara said, well, what the heck are you talking about? You have to be ready and you have to bring people to your farm. So we started to, to have people last year. We launched this supper club series and we got written up in the New York times, which was great. Our supper club, we decided to pre-sell tickets last year before Christmas for this year's supper club. We pre-sold everything. We had all this capital to work with for the rest of the year. And, and then, of course, COVID hit and we had to cancel our entire season. So we had to make this big pivot. So a lot of it is back to our teaching and our media work and trying to figure out how we can offer something to a lot of people, a broader audience, either through things like postcards with our recipes or a lot more online teaching, figuring out ways to sustain that. Plan to get back to events here, but we do not having a facility where we are very well set up to do something like value-added products and retail. So those, those didn't really work so much. And I'll just sort of mention quickly, we don't really have a lot to talk about in terms of funding for us because this has all been uh, self-funded and it's just kind of on a year-by-year -year basis where we we say what are the events we're going to do and what do we need basically at the time of the event because we you know we don't have our own facility here at the farm we're still fixing it up so our overhead is actually very very low we have been in a lot of talks over the past few years to try to get funding to actually build a commercial kitchen and an event facility and a teaching facility here at the farm but, you know, we really wanted that to happen before this year. But actually, you know, thank God we didn't actually get that facility going this year and have to make a monthly payment and have no cash flow from our in-person events. So we're still in the preliminary phases. We did get funded for a high tunnel this year. We do have a uh, heritage apple orchard that we planted. We're doing some farm research stuff. So a lot of the things that we set out for our farm a couple of years ago are actually happening, but we're pivoting in a way that we didn't really expect to. 
we, we do some very small funding things that are that are more about raising awareness and kind of building a community more so than making money like we have a retail shop online where we just sell some prints and some t-shirts and and again that's more about kind of building an audience and having some sustainability within those numbers than actually raising hard numbers of cash but we feel like our, our biggest opportunity once we get past this moment with covid and the farm is having a facility that can be partially a dining facility, but more so a teaching facility where we're able to have these maybe week long, several day long retreats here at the farm and cut down on our travel time, cut down on our outside sourcing and just sort of be able to establish a, an experience based on place here at the farm. So I think that's it. I think the last slide is just, yep, yeah. just content. So you're the only farm I know that's really becoming a media company, right? You think of yourself as a farm and, and you are a farm and you are doing what you're doing, but yeah, you're becoming an educational media company, which is super unusual and very, what you do is very powerful. So thank you for sharing your story. I appreciate it. 